Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight at the Wexner Center for the Arts at The Ohio State University uh, for what has become one of uh, our favorite evenings at the Wex. Uh, we initiated our director's dialogue on art and social change in early 2006. And with each passing year, I have to say, it feels somehow more vital and one could even say more urgent. Exploring such complex issues as gender bias, race relations, climate change, police brutality, healthcare disparities, and sexual violence. These programs have brought artists and cultural commentators together with academics and professionals in various fields to coax fresh perspectives on what often seem to be completely intractable issues. Tonight's program continues that trajectory and in some ways deepens the trajectory as well, taking as its point of departure a pioneering project that was conceived by filmmaker and Wright State Assistant Professor of Motion Pictures, Chinoye Chukwu, who's here and from whom you'll be hearing later, but Chinoya, would you like to simply say hello? There she is. <laughs> Pens to Pictures, Empowering Incarcerated Women from Script to Screen began just two years ago when Chinoya approached Dayton Correctional Facility with the idea of teaching some of the women there screenwriting and potentially filmmaking. So thanks in large part to the remarkable and truly, as I understand it, unwavering advocacy of DCI Warden Assistant Vivian Covington, who is also here with us this evening, as well as to many of Chinoy's film colleagues and friends from Dayton and elsewhere, uh, it became possible to commence um, a project that I think no one quite knew um, the culmination, but it is in fact many, in many ways the most ambitious project we've ever taken on here as the kind of point and, and focal point, I should say, of our director's dialogue. Not only the production of the five short films that you'll be seeing tonight, um, but Shinoya has also created an entirely new, not for profit entity, one that is dedicated to giving presence and voice to those essentially disappeared into incarceration, whether due to addiction, to trafficking, abuse, poverty, or some toxic combination thereof. When roughly 15 months ago, Chinoye was recommended to the Wexner Center's film video studio program, curator Jennifer Lang and editor Paul Hill immediately embraced the project agreeing to provide crucial resources through our artist residency program, which offers significant financial, professional, technical, and moral support to artists in the production of new work. And Paul in particular, I have to say, um, editor extraordinaire that he is, has not only devoted a tremendous amount of his WEX time, but his personal time as well over the last 15 months with multiple visits to DCI nearly weekly in order to work with the five women who of course could not, and could not leave the prison in order to direct their films, but worked with co-directors who came to them. There's also been a documentary created by Chinoya and Paul working together, and we will be premiering that here this evening as well. Having accompanied Jennifer and, Fall, and Paul um, to DCI earlier this year for the initial screening of the five films, which I have to say was an incredibly memorable and moving experience, I was so taken with the power of these works, so touched by the women who had made them, their courage, their honesty, their fierce camaraderie and loyalty to one another, their compassion and their fierce determination in the face of so much adversity. 
it was simply overwhelming and the project became really a natural focal point for this year's director's dialogue, a kind of centerpiece and a catalyst as well. And in fact, the films and the searing stories that they tell really compelled all of us here at the Wexner Center to devise an even more robust program than normally accompanies our director's dialogues. Enter Alana Ryder, our educator for university and public programs, who together with Jennifer Lang orchestrated what they dubbed the trifecta. Um, first, a session this afternoon for students and others where the five filmmakers, three of whom remain incarcerated, all participated, one via Skype, with Chinoya to discuss the films post-screening. First Lady Karen Kasich was actually in the house. She learned about the program, wanted to be there, and I dare say um, I watched her as she listened raptly to all of the women uh, on stage today, and I have to wonder a little bit about Pillow Talk at the Governor's Mansion tonight. Yeah. Following that session, we hosted what was called a Take Action Forum. Again, the work of Alana Ryder, Kelly Morgan, and many others on our team to invite some two dozen area organizations that in one way or another are wrestling with the profound impact of incarceration and successful re-entry. Uh, and now, of course, our director's dialogue on art and social change, which once again seeks to bring all of these voices together with all of you in the public um, to address some issues that are often tough to, to wrangle, tough to really completely comprehend and certainly tough to abide. Mass incarceration, of course, is among those, and as some of you may know, it's actually the population of women in prisons today, not just in Ohio, but around the country, which is growing most rapidly. I speak for the entire Wexner Center staff when I say that these are the occasions that most focus and energize our work together. Yes, it's always rooted in the creative process. It's always advancing artistic expression. It's always taking the lead of the artist, but at the same time, helping to galvanize social change on multiple fronts. So once again, to Jennifer, to Paul, to Alana, to our marketing and development departments, our patron service teams, to our deputy director, and so many others across the center for getting the word out about this program. My utmost respect and appreciation. And also um, for really putting their heart and heads behind shaping a really extraordinary day here at the Wexner Center. Let me also thank our funders, the United Way of Central Ohio and its new dynamic leader, Lisa Cordes, Gail V. King, the always generous Puffin Foundation West and its partner, Java, uh, founder, I should say, Java Kittrick, and Kathy Chapin Kobacker. My sincere gratitude to all of you as well for your presence and for your willingness to engage in a conversation that is so fraught with painful realities and raw emotions. To set the stage for the rest of the evening, you will first see the five films created by the women in collaboration with their co-directors and with Chinoya. Then the newly minted uh, commissioned docu documentary about the project, which literally Paul was putting finishing touches on uh, yet this afternoon. And then following that, we hope you will stay for what promises to be a riveting discussion that will be moderated by Townsend Price Spratlin, Associate Professor of Sociology here at OSU, where his research explores faith, social justice, and community capacity building. He's currently analyzing how faith health relationships help to reduce health disparities and how former felons collaborate with grassroots organizations to nurture community building. 
Price Spratlin is the author of Nurturing Sanctuary, Community Capacity Building in African American Churches, and Reconstructing Rage, Transformative Reentry in the Era of Mass Incarceration. Townsend will in turn introduce his fellow panelists, including the inimitable and irre irrepressible Shinoye Chuku. And um, I must say, in these times of um, acts of God and forces of nature, she's a benevolent one, <laughs> sort of swirling across the country. So now, thank you again for coming, and let's roll the films. Good evening. Thanks very much for coming out tonight and sticking around. Um, we're going to be in fellowship for a bit with the panel. Um, my name is Townsend Price Spratlin, um, and I'm, I, a set of one of my favorite poets is Audre Lorde, and a set of her lines are running through my head as I reflect in this moment and what we've just seen. Um, one of which is, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, and the ways in which uh, we saw the dare of power manifest uh, in the brilliance and genius of these uh, artists uh, was quite powerful. Um, let's get it started uh, by, uh, uh, I'll turn to the panel and each of them can, uh, can introduce themselves. Good evening, my name is Chinoya Chuku and, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> Um, I am a writer, director, and I am also a professor, educator, social justice advocate, and the founder of the Pens to Pictures program. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tammy Fournier Alsada. I am a lifelong resident of Columbus, Ohio, a formerly incarcerated individual. Currently, I am uh, a community resource specialist with the Juvenile Justice Coalition of Ohio and also a lead organizer with the People's Justice Project. So, I'm Audrey Begun. I'm on the faculty in the College of Social Work here at Ohio State University. And I guess my claim to fame here tonight is work that I've done in both in Wisconsin and here in Ohio. Uh, with women who've been incarcerated, uh, helping get them ready for reentry into the community, addressing their substance use issues. I'm going to move through a set of questions um, and are certainly open to your dialogue and your curiosities as we move the evening forward after the panel discussion uh, for a period of time. So. Please uh, be, continue to form uh, the questions that you have, and uh, there'll be time and mics available uh, for you both uh, for those to address those themes and issues that arise for you. Um, let's begin, if we could, uh, with because I mean, part of me, to be quite honest, y'all, I was like, oh my God, Let, let's let's just begin with an affirmation <laughs> or a moment of silence or yes, pause yes, or something yes. like. Uh, or uh, woo. center, center, center. Yeah, <laughs> what, whatever you do in your place of grace, or, or however you manifest, whether it's theistic or otherwise, uh, uh, please come to that center in, 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 in whatever way has meaning for you after what we um, saw. Um, okay, sorry. Um, so, why is art essential? Why is art essential toward realizing a broader justice? Could we start there? Wow, for many reasons. Um, art is voice. Art is your voice, your expression. And in a world where certain people are silenced more than others, it's, it's so critical to use art to stand in your own power through your voice, through your expression. Um, it is, it, it, it you know, it, with pens to pictures, it was a way of, it was a pathway to joy and empowerment and confidence and purpose. Um, it was a way to, it was a pathway to uh, better self-actualize, um, to realize our worth, to realize our potential, and it expanded our possibilities. 
So it's not just the art form, but it is the journey and it is the process um, that really allows for this kind of expansion of self. I would add, and thank you, I, would, <laughs> I don't know if we're applauding, but, but I would add to that, one of the things that I recognize is, and we often share with our young people, is that we're the experts of our experiences. Um, and so when we're able to capture those experiences, be it through film or pictures, um, I think right now in this digital age that we are in, we've been bombarded with a lot of images that we cannot unsee these stories we cannot unsee. And so what are we required to do having seen these things? Um, a lot of times we talk about the life experiences of people in communities um, that we don't often get a chance or an opportunity to touch or be directly in relationship to. And so when we get opportunities like this to, and there were so many powerful stories um, we talked in the back a little bit before coming out here. One of the things that we know we must do is think about what we're going to do next, knowing these things and seeing these things. And so the power of that, the power of our story, um, the power of images. I was reminded um, a few years ago when bombs were dropping in Gaza and the images that came out of that, the power of images that are burned on our memory. And we can't unsee those things. And so we must use those things and they call us into action. So, and I think in addition that it's a form of communication so that we can go beyond things like the kind of sterile statistics to really seeing a reality that makes us think about it very differently and make us, you know, once we start to feel it, we're willing to more, more willing to sign on to a, mo a movement or, a, or an action. Mm -hmm. sure. Thanks, each of you. Um, let's see. One of the things, as, as we move and reflect upon the use of art toward a broader justice, one element of that broader justice that is sort of valuable to me, and I, w I would guess many of us, that that's what led us to this night and led, uh, led uh, Chinonye to, to initiate the project in the first place. But I, I, I can't infer motive. Um, I guess I'm moving toward what are the pathways toward how we heal? Because uh, I'm, I'm like... After that, how, how do we, how do those folks, various characters in, in selected uh, segments heal? Um, or are they healing? Is that that's a manifestation of what we saw, a portion of their healing process perhaps? But I guess the question is, what pathways toward healing of trauma do the films provide? No, go ahead. Uh, you know, that's an excellent question. Again, recognizing many of us in the audience in watching the film have experienced um, secondhand trauma. We witnessed some very traumatic scenes tonight. Um, part of in, in the movement work that we do is it took us a minute as we were activists and out there raising awareness, even through these films, is, a, is an expression of awareness. But understanding that as we get close to these stories, these are human beings. These are real lives that we're talking about. And the recognition, I think I'm really excited about the direction our state is going and recognizing the need for trauma recovery and healing. Um, what we say in our work is that we must create space. A young man that I work with that was near and dear to my heart, um, Marshawn McHale, um, peace be upon his name, helped us to realize that there must be space for us to heal as we go out and, and, and do this work and raise awareness through these films. Um, oftentimes we get in, um, bombarded with so many stories and so many things that we're being required and called on to do, but we must stop and pause and be rooted in the ideal that these things are traumatic. And as a woman, um, as a woman who experienced incarceration firsthand, there are so many women like the women we saw tonight, um, some that are still behind the walls and some that are returning to your communities that need us to recognize that they have not only leading up to their incarceration, experiencing some traumatic things, but the experience of incarceration is traumatic. Um, and so those of us that work in the field or touch the field or touch people or, or just are available, and a lot of times we think it's systems that must solve these problems, but we as caring community folks that love each other enough have the ability to be available to people as they return home, as they seek treatment, as they experience trauma, and I'm excited about the conversation starting to happen, but we really must be rooted in the ideal of restorative justice, 
trauma recovery and healing in spaces where people can talk about their pain and not have to navigate through a lot of other systems to get to the healing that they need. And to your point about navigating the pain, I think for me, I think the first, you know, I'm, I, question, I, I kind of like interrogate the word healing. Right, because it, to me, I mean, I want. Some, I think oftentimes it suggests some sort of um, like end point, and I think it's this. I, th I rather I think it's this like evolving um, kind of navigating of feelings and these kind of and your complex humanities. And so I think that the art, the arts can allow us to feel and make ourselves vulnerable. You know, I've been teaching screenwriting for almost ten years now, and almost. Every semester, I always have at least one student like break down in sobs. And because they, in, in, in writing, in really allowing themselves to go there, they kind of unlocked something that, was, that they were really trying not to investigate. And, you know, I, I, I think that with, I heard Beverly talk about earlier today at the three o'clock session that part of the reason why she wrote Devastating Game was because abuse, which is so pervasive, so pervasive in our world, in our societies, in our lives, does not get talked about enough, particularly abuse towards women, which is like one of the number one killers of, of, of women and cre creates direct pathways toward, to women's incarceration. And so, I mean, and Beverly's in the house here, so you can correct me if I'm, I, I'm putting words in your mouth, but my understanding was that you wanted to write a film, you wanted to create a piece of art that can encourage people to kind of interrogate their own struggles and feelings and trauma related to abuse. And that's the power. And I think once you allow yourself to feel and have compassion for yourself and compassion for your own humanity, it can not only allow you to begin this healing, but it can allow you to see the humanity in other people and potentially see the trauma that informs other people's decisions that may or may not be harmful towards others. Did, did I, like I can add something, add something to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we did when we were uh, looking at what was going on in the lives of women who were incarcerated was we asked them what the system should look like. What should a treatment system look like if it's going to do you any good? And one of the things that, that almost all of the women said is it needs to start while I'm incarcerated. Don't wait until I am get back in the community struggling with all of these other demands of you know finding shelter and food and trying to get my kids back and whatever I need to start the process while I'm still incarcerated and one of the things that we know about jail in particular is that services to women while they're incarcerated tends to be based on what is available not what should be available and that really is the first place I think to try to make change um, what is available isn't very much for a lot of reasons. Um, what should be available is very different, and that's where these women are telling us if we start here and then we have a continuity plan for continuing what I need in terms of services and care once I'm back in the community, that's what a good system would look like. Helpful, helpful. Okay, I'd like to move, if we could, back to the art of feeding on um, Chinonye's comment related to humanity, and in particular, picking up on a portion of the dialogue that we had before we came out here, um, in, and that has to do with dissonance or tensions related to the presentation of what we saw on the screen. The question is, what authority figures gave you hope and why? but the tensions related to police officers and characterizations thereof, um, authenticity of experience with them. But, so uh, authority figures and uh, hope. You know, there have been a couple times I've, I've a couple times people have asked questions about um, the two police officers that we saw, one in Transparent and one in Devastating Game, as these, these authority figures, these representatives of the police state Right, which is literally creating, literally bol helping to bolster incarceration, are seen as positive figures, are seen as people who are the only ones seemingly in the story to help the protagonist characters. And there were some people who really were struggling with that and were asking questions about whether or not they're kind of like promoting what those individuals, those kind of systems and that these individuals represent. 
And my response is that, well, one, these, this, these are authentic experiences from people's lives. And so because of that, it's valid, right? There's no question. But I think it, it also, we also have to complicate things, right? We have, there's a difference between questioning and dismantling systems of oppression and looking at the individuals who, can, who are part of those systems who can, who can actually be positive influencers. Perfect example is the warden's assistant, Ms. Vivian Covington. Ms. Vivian Covington is the warden's assistant at Dayton Correctional Institution, and she's also the project coordinator of Pens to Pictures. This program would not have happened without Vivian Covington. Vivian Covington gave me, set the blueprint for how to treat people as human beings, and yet she works in the prison system. What do we make of that, right? We don't write off, we don't write off Ms. Covington, right? She is somebody who is a positive influencer, and I think that that is where we need to be more complicated in our thinking and, 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 and not so binary, and really be clear about it, like dismantling the systems and, and challenging the systems uh, and, uh, as opposed to writing off every individual who is a part of that. Um, and thank you for that. And, and I think it's, it's important that we examine that. Um, and I totally agree. In the three years that I spent incarcerated, there were several um, very caring guards and administrative staff. Actually, even tonight, I met um, one of the program directors from the Tapestry Program. I, I don't know if she's still out here in the audience, um, which was a program I was a part of when I was incarcerated in Marysville um, Correctional Institution. So yes, there are caring people. Um, some here in the audience, I'm looking in their faces now, they were part of my time in incarceration and also part of my reentry as I returned home to Franklin County and later became one of the founding members of Franklin County's Reentry Task Force. See folks out in the audience now that were part of that. Um, so yes, there are nameless people inside the institution, inside the system that we seek to dismantle um, that care. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that oftentimes in communities of color, what re-traumatizes is police, and those that are dressed as in a way that don't see our humanity. Um, that we get caught up and mirrored in a system. Currently in my work, I work with youth attached to the criminal, the juvenile justice system. And what our experiences are navigating through that system is that youth and families oftentimes don't get heard, they don't get seen, they don't get a voice. And oftentimes, even through our school systems, our organization recently helped to pass a bill that addresses the amount of youth in Franklin County that are, are in the state that are attached to the juvenile court. And what we found is, again and again, many of these young people said that they weren't being seen or heard. And so we ha cannot lose sight of the fact, and especially for young black men, um, the traumatic experiences that they experience when they are attached or confronted by police. And so we've gotten real comfortable with the ideal that I'll call the police or I'll call children's services and everything will be okay. And we understand that we're dealing with broken systems and overwhelmed systems. And our focus must be on supporting those systems, examining. Currently, right now, we're looking at the juvenile justice center system, understanding that we're slamming young people up against the system, and we don't keep data on what even happens to them. We don't, we don't really follow through to see if this is the right place for young people to be. Um, and we cannot lose sight of the fact that across this country, there is a broken relationship as it pertains to police and citizens that must be addressed. And so I think it's important that we do acknowledge that. Um, we can't rose color paint that over, but that the fact that um, in much of my work and our work with People's Justice Project is one, and it's real hard for me because I have a cousin who is a police, um, works for Columbus Police here in the city that I grew up with. We played ball together, played in dirt together, and currently he's a police officer, and we go back and forth on this issue. I have a lot of family members. I actually chaired the Ohio State Youth Violence Advisory Board with Deputy Chief Jeff Blackwell, who I still call on the phone today, who is my friend. Um, but we cannot, and it's real easy to say, you know, we're saying all these things about police and all police are not bad. I totally agree, my family's not bad. But we are guilty by association if we are continuing to allow 
the um, abuse of our citizens to exist, and those good officers that we speak to don't stand up and acknowledge that that is in existence. And I think that is the key, right? What are they doing? If they're going to be in those positions, if they're going to be a part of those systems, what are they doing themselves to help challenge and dismantle it? Because don't get me wrong. Now listen, <laughs> don't get me wrong, OK? Like, I, 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 I hear you, and I totally, I, I'm, I totally agree. And, and I mean, I, I, get, I, I, I can totally get the triggering, and it's so, that's why it's so complicated, yeah, right? Very, because, keeps us up. right, but we have, so I, I just, yeah, we have to hold them accountable, and I don't think that, I, I totally understand if you don't want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt because of the history and the context, it's, but it's like, what do, you, what do you do with that then? Like, how do you, how do you? Yeah. you and, I, and I think that's that. something that we must wrestle with. Part of what yeah. I know we must do, and I'm definitely, I'm being transpa very transparent here, I am part of an organization that has at times been on the outside confronting power yeah. and, and the systems that exist to oppress us. Yeah. But I've also been that one at the table mm. um, in conversation, in most difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. And what I know it will take is us to sit down together. Mm -hmm. Um, and to have those difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. We didn't just get here. Yes. Um, one of the things that, that, that troubles me and keeps me up and I wrestle with is the fact when I went to, pr I went to prison in 1993, 94, and I spent three years of incarceration. Uh, but my mother went to prison and spent three years of incarceration. And while I was in prison, my son went to prison and spent three years of incarceration. And so we're talking about systemic generational things that are set up to oppress us. Mm -hmm. And we're not asleep on that. Yeah. We understand that this is not some new anomaly that we're addressing. This is things that have happened to a community that must be addressed. And it must be addressed not only on policing and how we massively, in this great nation that I love, in a city that I love, at a university that I love, go Bucks. <laughs> We are allowing things to happen. I said in this auditorium, I was just thinking as I walked in six years ago, screening a film called The Violence Interrupters on gun violence. And we've packed this auditorium and we had great conversations. Some of the things, and it saddens me as a child of the 60s, that we're fighting some battles again and again and again. And so we must realize that we can only, cannot only just keep having conversations and, and, and watching films, but each of us must be challenged to figure out what are we going to do to address this problem. Now, I know this city has the ability and the power and enough education, I'm looking at y'all, to address this problem. We can be a model in our own city on how we change how we view certain communities. Um, the average stay of incarceration is three years. We're slamming folks into a system that will come home in three years. I share with you my mother, myself, and my son, three years. And the thing that got me home, when I came home from prison, and I don't mean to hog the energy, but I was fortunate enough to be in a halfway house, and I had some folks that I'm looking at right now that were able to be there of support, and we don't do that anymore. So there's a lot of things that we can do, and it will take us sitting down in a conversation, equally seated at a table, to get to the solutions that we see. Mm -hmm. sure. um, if we could, let's, um, before we, um, as before y'all leave, if you have any questions, please be in fellowship um, to share them with us. And before we uh, come down to, uh, to join you in this dialogue further, um, a few more questions. Um, let's, let's feed on Tammy's point um, by addressing both policy dialogues and policy issues narrowly defined, or more broadly, strategies of action for change and intended transformation. Uh, back to Chinyoni's uh, earlier point. So I guess the question would be, what's, what, what's the value of policy dialogues that the, film, that the films take us to? And what, what are some of those that we might be thinking of and reflecting upon, and how should we move forward with them? So one of the things that I think is important for us to understand is the impact that the war on drugs historically has had on incarceration and on communities, um, families, communities. And there's just two quotes that I wanted to read to you. One of them was, I did a little homework this weekend. <laughs> um, Sandra Enos, back in 2001, said, we may not be winning the war on drugs, but we are taking a lot of prisoners. That's 
fairly profound. That, that, that is one of the reasons for this mass incarceration trend that we've been seeing. The other one I think that is also really important and very relevant to what we're talking about tonight is from Stephanie Bush Besquet, who said, the war on drugs has been a war on women, and black women in particular. And this is coming out of a lot of what the statistics have shown in terms of really um, huge discrepancies in terms of the rates at which women are ending up incarcerated and which women are ending up incarcerated and those trends. I looked up the statistics of what's happened in Ohio. Um, but despite the fact that nationally incarceration rates went down a little bit between 2014 and 2015, incarceration rates in the state of Ohio went up. I don't really understand that. I don't know Ohio well enough to know. The difference for men was 1.6%. For women was 8%. So I don't understand that discrepancy either. Well, I'll say a couple things. Um, I, I think, hmm. so I think a couple things. I think that we need to re, I think we need to challenge and interrogate the way that we as a society uh, think about and relate to violent offenses. Um, I think the statistic is like 67% who are currently incarcerated in state prisons. Um, are, have been convicted of a violent felony. To be convicted of a violent felony, I think that most of us might think, oh, you, somebody like, did some bodily harm to somebody. But not necessarily. Um, to have a violent felony you don't, doesn't necessarily mean that. But yet, I think a lot, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a lot of evidence that shows that a lot of the reform efforts towards mass incarceration goes towards Drug people who were convicted of drug offenses or the quote unquote, the, like the, the politically kind of like sat the correct term, low level drug offenders. But we can't look at that. We have to have the hard conversations of what does reform look like for the way that we sentence violent felonies? What does reform look like in terms of the way we as a society uh, portray and think of people who have been convicted of violent, felony, violent felonies. Um, statistically, when reform ha efforts happen for, drug, for, for those convicted of low-level drug offenses, the sentencing gets harsher for people who com com committed uh, violent felonies. So if s about 67% of people incarcerated have violent offenses, so what does that mean? Um, and so those are some hard conversations that I, I think it's really difficult to have and like politically unsexy. <laughs> when you're talking about like how do we reform, you know, people who committed murder or, or committed whatever, you know? Um, so I think that that's something that we have to have a conversation about. We also need to have conversations about prosecutorial conduct <laughs> and the fact that there is no, almost no oversight over the way prosecutors can do their job. 95% of people who are incarcerated took a plea and the person they negotiated the plea with is the prosecutor. And so there's no, from like nine times out of 10, there's no like book or standard of conduct for how a prosecutor is gonna go ahead and throw around, you know, I'm you're looking at life, so you better take this plea of 25. Like what, what, what is that, like what does that mean um, to, to demand transparency from the prosecutors, from the judges, from, from all the judges, from the police officers, from everybody involved at the state and local levels. 90% um, of people who are incarcerated are incarcerated in a state prison facility. So the people who are most directly linked to, 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 to locking people up are the prosecutors, are the judges, are the, the officers, you know? And so what does reform look like? What can we do as citizens to, to impact change at the local and state level? One, we vote, <laughs> you know? We vote. Most district attorneys run unopposed. Like how many of us know what judges are in our district? How many of us know who, are, who, are, who the prosecutors are? They're the ones who are determining, like they're the ones who are directly impacting who is going into prisons and jails. And so I think we need to vote, we need to educate ourselves and hold people accountable. Um, and so that, that's kind of like my two cents for kind of starting <laughs> points. I also got, I, there's also a whole bunch of stuff about dismantling toxic masculinity because the abuse to prison pipeline is so real. Um, but those are some starting points. <laughs>
<laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Thank you. And I would just add to that, really, it's important for us to really lean heavily on the data mm -hmm. and the disproportionate numbers and who is being sentenced mm -hmm. to incarceration, um, looking at the women's population. Um, I heard someone use a term, and I'm not sure who, who used this first, but we're literally um, penalizing poverty mm -hmm. and incarcerating. Most of what we see is are people trying to meet basic needs of food and shelter and clothing. When we look at women incarceration and mothers, and many of these stories were wrapped in mothers that have children that are counting and depending on them. And so the generational cycle, it's not by chance that my mother went to prison and then I went to prison and my son went to prison. Gen generationally, we're passing on the ideal of incarceration. And the thing that must be added to that ideal is during the time that I went to prison, and, and we're talking about the war on drugs and the crack epidemic, I can't sit in this seat. I went to prison addicted to crack cocaine. And I stole, and I caught mm -hmm. theft cases that led me to prison, but the only underlying root cause was I was addicted to crack cocaine. And so now we're addressing opiates in our communities. And I cannot sit on this stage and not say, and it's real triggering for me, because now we're looking at it differently but we threw away a whole generation in my community. The treatment for my recovery, kicking crack cocaine, was laying on the county jail floor. Watching other women lay on the county jail floor and kick crack cocaine. And now we're being more compassionate, but I cannot sit here and not say that the damage and the residue of the crack epidemic and the war on drugs has now morphed into gun violence. And so those children that didn't have a mother and a father that was sent to prison are now out on our streets. And, and the saddest thing about it is the greatest fear we face when I was growing up running the streets was somebody was going to go to prison. And now my neighborhood is faced with somebody going to die. Just this week, we and Amber mentioned out in the, in the foyer or earlier that a young man that we were fighting to get on the right track affected by mass incarceration as his mother was in Texas helping folks in the hurricane, was shot and killed on Saturday night here in Columbus. We're at 90 homicides and rising. And so we just, the, the, the transformation or the morphing of what we're producing because we're not addressing addiction and mental health and trauma is what we see. And the way that we are treating it is through policing and mass incarceration. And that must change. Audrey, would you like to speak? Okay. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now is to turn to, um, do, well, sorry, got to break form here for only a bit. Through one of my uh, re current research projects, um, an individual who I, I'm, I'm dealing with recovery fellowships, and just hearing what Tammy just said, um, just this past week, an individual who I had come to know, who so possible, I mean, so possible, young, 20s, 20 something, 25, 26, actually OD'd on the steps of a church not too far from here. And it just, he, he had been, so we're criminalizing what is actually a very, a highly treatable yes. disorder or disease of, whether it's disease in the way that diabetes is a disease is, is, is up to interpretation, but um, d disease in terms of d disorder. And I just, it, it is such, it, I just don't know what to do um, with the, the, the paradox of him ODing on church steps in the process of his pain. Um, and his funeral was just last, just on Friday. Um, anyway, so we, criminal, I'm with, uh, cr criminalizing what is a disease yes. um, is, is, is clearly not working. Not and, working. and I think the important thing that you said here is that it is a treatable disease. And, and unfortunately, one of the things that's happened is all of the research about what treatment works has systematically excluded people who are incarcerated for research design reasons. So the very population that most needs these interventions are the ones that are being excluded from them. That's just crazy. 
Okay, um, th thanks to each of our uh, panelists. We'd like to open it up. The panelist remains. Um, we'd like to open it up to you um, in fellowship with whatever questions you might, excuse me, you might have. If you'd be willing to come to one of the mics uh, and uh, we open up the floor in fellowship. Evening, Stephen, thank you for this remarkable project that you've brought to us, to the women. And to go back to your question about the arts, the arts are about healing. It gives voice, if, for those who don't have a voice, who can't speak about what's happened to them, the arts are a vehicle for healing, whether it be on a stage, a page, a canvas. They're also a vehicle for raising awareness and raising consciousness. Historically, we know that the arts have brought to the public social issues. So they're a vehicle for that. And they're also a vehicle for change, bringing about change within an individual, within a society. So thank you again for using the arts to give voice to us all. Question is collaboration. In the mission statement here, you're open to collaboration. How do we do that? How do we, well. within the arts, <laughs> <laughs> and using the, using the arts for social justice, collaborate with you? Yes, well, um, I have beautifully printed postcards with contact information on it. So please um, make sure that I give that to you so you could get more information and contact info. Um, but there are a lot of different ways. There's so much collaboration there, um, that, that happens in Pens to Pictures. I mean, with the, with the co-directors. Who are any of them here? Can I just give a shout out to the co-directors? I think there's like two, Liz and Chandra. <laughs> Um, but the co-directors, the crew, um, the actors, um, we're, we're, there's so many community artists who were a part of this um, at all of the different stages. So there's that collaboration. We also collaborate with different organizations to host screenings. So since March of this year, we've been screening the films and we're getting ready to do screenings at different universities and colleges and libraries and nonprofit organizations and prisons and jails and festivals and art galleries all over the country. We recently came back from the NAACP National Convention in Baltimore and screened some of the films there. So there's that kind of way. There's also institutional partnerships. I mean, this costs money and it requires so a lot of different resources. So if you are part of an organization or have connections to different kinds of resources that we would need to make these films and share them with the share them with the world. That that's one way. Um, we also would love to expand and partner with different universities and colleges around the country, so that and 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 different facilities around the country, so that we can um, be, have different kind of pens to pictures chapters um, around. And so that's definitely um, something that we're looking into right now. Does that answer your question? Do you fall into one of those categories or <laughs> one or more of those categories? I'd love to talk. Yes. <laughs> and anybody else? I mean, this has been this is this has gone beyond what we had originally intended and and, and imagined. And so we're I think we're kind of going for the ride and, yes. and really now moving in the space of being intentional about the growth of this program and the possibilities that that it encapsulates. And so um, if there's anybody else here who would love to talk with me or love to get more information from me about collaborating um, in any of those ways that I described or any other ways that you can think of, I would love that. I'm open. Let's do it. Scott, um, I wrote my question down because it's a bit lengthy. Uh, this is a question for all three panelists. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the work you did with the woman inside the prison. It really touched my heart, and it's um, it made them human because a lot of people forget that behind these prisons and jails, it's just humans trying to survive who may end up in a undesirable lifestyle, for lack of better words, and end up in a system which um, was made to only imprison them. 
So my question is, have you ever thought of changing the path that you're using to seek justice for prisoners and formerly incarcerated individuals, as well as citizens whom are not yet incarcerated, but are on the path to prison because um, just listening to the panel, I hear a lot about reform, but the real question is how do you reform slavery? As you were working with these women, did you speak to them about the reality of their condition, and, uh, which is slavery, and how they can organize from the inside on abolishing what is called mass incarceration, but through the 13th Amendment, clause is le actually legalized slavery. And I know you visit prisons as well, so I feel like it's very important for us to organize from the inside the prisoners and make them aware and educate them on the 13th Amendment clause because it was nothing but a transition from plantation slavery into the prison system. This is why a lot of men and women, especially black men and women, are inside the prison system. It's not a system that's been broken, but it's perfectly fine how it is because that's how it was made to be. So I would like your input on that. And I would also like to work with you as well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great question and it's, it's complicated and it's something that I grapple with too because I definitely um, would consider myself, in terms of my politics, in terms of the way that I envision my future and possibilities, I, I, I'm definitely for the abolition of prisons, right? And, and all kinds of slavery, systemic slavery. And so that's something I grappled with. What does it mean then for me to be doing this program in a prison. The reality is, is that today, there will still be millions of people incarcerated. And do I then not do this? Do I then not use, utilize the privileges that I embody to try to create a space, even if it's a small space, for a level of liberation amid the physical enslavement that they might be in. And I had to really grapple with that, and, I did, and we had many, and we still do, have many conversations about that. I don't go in there with the intention of educating them about their condition. That's not my place. What I do do is, is, is talk about, we have many conversations about what are the different privileges that we all embody. Um, and it kind of goes from there. And so I don't really have a clear-cut answer to your question. Um, but I, I, and I, I do also kind of like grapple with the word reform because I don't think that that is really the goal. Um, but what does, and so this is a great question, what does a world without prisons look like? What does abolition look like? What does it look like while we are uh, in, on September 6, 2017, living in the reality of a carceral state? And I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's really important to grapple that and to, and to be clear that that's what we're really dealing with. We're not trying to reform slavery. We're not trying to, you know, um, you make a little bit of change, but still stay within the, but still stay shackled. Um, how do we create spaces of liberation um, even amid, amid this carceral state that we're living in. And I mean, I, I, in doing research for a script that I wrote, I read Troy Davis's biography slash autobiography. Troy Davis was a black man who was executed in a Georgia state prison in 2011. And what was the most moving thing for me about the book was that it was him talking about how, how free he was. And this was just days before he was executed and how nobody could take that freedom from him. Nobody can take that light. And I, 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 I wonder if that kind of liberation is what we work towards right now while we're still in the carceral state and trying to move towards a world without prisons. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so we wrestle. So we wrestle. Yeah, so we wrestle. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's important. Um, and thank you, Hannah, for mm -hmm. that question. Um, and Hannah and I wrestle with that question often. One of the things I think many of us, if we've come to see this, have probably seen the film The 13th Amendment. Um, and we've probably read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. Um, and so what we know is that 
historically throughout this country, what we've done since slavery is continue to reform. So the reforming of was Jim Crow and segregation, and then we moved to this mm -hmm. ideal of mass incarceration, which I was just learning, I was on a panel with some abolitionists, that that whole ideal of the word mass incarceration kind of is this new language that we're using to describe or redescribe something old. Um, and so that we must be clear and intentional in our language that people are being enslaved and the 13th Amendment says that they are slaves once they are incarcerated. And that's hard for some of us to digest when we start even using that word. But we must confront the evilness of a system that puts people in cages and treats them as less than human beings. And that's the reality of what we're talking about. And so it's comfortable for us to use new terms. Um, I was telling someone not too long ago, we're using this new term, restorative justice and therapeutic and trauma and healing and therapeutic communities. Well, in 1993, 94, I was in prison in what they were calling therapeutic communities and pull-ups, which was restorative justice circles. So we keep on putting these new labels on things. Um, and we must confront it as ugly as it is. As we confront all some of these ugly things that we're faced with in this nation today, we must call them by their name. And we must recognize that in this country that we all love, that people are slaves if they are incarcerated, and that is in our Constitution, and it must be amended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just to add to the dialogue, if we if could, I very much celebrate what, is, what has been shared and um, in keeping with that, uh, with that sensibility. Um, there are individuals, there are organizations, grassroots organizations out in various cities here in central Ohio, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in New York, in various places throughout the country that are centering the, the progress that you speak of that takes the 13th, the meaning of that clause into consideration, valuing returning citizens as the primary resource for that transformation. Um, one such organization uh, is what my first book focuses upon, Reconstruction Incorporated. Members of Reconstruction Incorporated housed in, uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, will be here the first week of December, and there are gonna be a set of events um, that are taking place um, on this campus related, well, actually two of them are gonna be on the campus, and then one is gonna be at the African American and African Studies Department Community Extension Center um, in, the, in the community. It's a, a university property. But the point is that it focuses on returning citizens, the, the issue of language, returning sure. citizens and, the, and centering it in their citizenship and the engagement, the, the processes of civic engagement with them centered in the, pro, in the means of them creating their own solution. So mm -hmm. there are a wide variety of ways in which that is being engaged. Um, that is just one of multiple organizations and there's, there's certainly more to speak on related to how others can get involved if that sentiment is, uh, it, it wants to be moved from you know, a, a worldview to actual f b feet on the ground toward a broader justice. It, it's happening, it's happening as we speak. I, I would just add to that, it's important to note too as we move to those kind of conversations. So under the Bush administration, um, George W. Bush wrote the Second Chance Act um, that spoke to what we wanted as a nation and as a country at that time for people that returned home from incarceration. One of the things that we know, those of you that have followed the Second Chance Act, it was written in, 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 uh, under the Bush administration when I was coming home for prison. What we did not do was put funding mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. these things that we write. Okay. And so there's this beautiful document, please look it up, the Second Chance Act of Opportunity. Many of the reentry task forces that you see around the nation are founded on that concept. Um, but we haven't put in directed funding. And so it's crucial as we begin to look at these, what we call reforms, that we're directing dollars mm -hmm. to make sure that the implementation happens so that we get to the solutions. Absolutely. As we move those complicated conversations forward, I would just love, and I'm not doing it, uh, but I think in this room, there is a, a variable that is, what is your view toward what was shared related to a world without prisons. Do we seek, how many among us are prison abolitionists? Again, I'm not 
asking you to raise hands. I'm just saying, even in a crowd like this, that's my guess would be that that's a variable and there's worth in exploring and moving forward with addressing strategies of action that are within the shared values of different subgroups that, that, uh, that are at different places along that variable. Um, I, well, I think there's great worth envisioning a world without prisons. Yes. That's a good thing. I, I would hope that, and wherever you, however you feel about that, um, let's move those complicated conversations forward. And tonight is one piece, one piece thereof. Um, so I celebrate y'all being a part of it. Please. Hi. Um, one thing I noticed when we were going through the screening was that all these stories that the incarcerated women shared were familiar stories. Like this is not something we don't hear about reg regularly. Like whether it be through gossip or even in the news, we hear it, but we, we, like, we never see it and we never recognize it as a problem that can be relatable. And so when you said that some policemen were like guilty by associating or association and how this issue is not new, we also can, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is, even though we, um, we don't have a social platform, we're not like famous people, we can still like use our voice to um, challenge the norm. And so what I'm trying to get at is that this is all relatable and we needed the screening to, um, to show that uh, we all can say something. So I'm, um, what my question is, is even um, us without without like a um, a pr like a social presence, what can we do to challenge the norms that um, are going around that lead to mass incarceration? So I I would and thank you so much, my sister, for that question. You're doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, what we can do is stay in this in the rooms, not just this room but other rooms where these conversations are happening. It's not easy. Um, as a Muslim sister, my husband is Palestinian, and so assalamu alaikum to you, my sister. Um, it's difficult, especially for us as women and, and in our culture and what society requires us, of us as women. But when, it, when we find um, spaces like these um, and others, um, one of the unique things about living in Columbus, there is a group for everything. Um, that you can get actively involved and there is safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. One of us alone can tackle all of these things that we're speaking about tonight, but collectively a group of us together uh, can build enough power to confront a very powerful system of oppression for us as women and mass incarceration. And power is the ability to act. That's all it is. Power is the ability to do something about it. And collectively together in small groups, we can do something about this system. And it's starting tonight. It's starting in telling these stories. The courage it took these women to share their pain and their experiences is what will set the next woman free. And it's that ripple effect. And so just keep staying in the room. Keep showing up. Um, here on this university campus, I know I got some colleagues over here now, um, Kenza and Buckeye Weech that are on campus, that I know they would love to wrap you up and get you activated. <laughs> Um, stay in the room, stay connected, and alone we can't do anything. Um, but even in prison, I was organizing in prison, we're gonna have a meeting tonight after, break, after dinner. Um, because I knew that the conditions we faced were not looking at me or any of us as human beings. And so that's where the spirit of organizing came from in me inside an institution and I knew that it, my voice had power. It got me in a lot of trouble as I'm sure y'all are aware. But your voice has power and use your voice. And not being afraid of only the small things that you can do, because those small things add up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming out this evening, uh, for joining in, in fellowship. 
uh, in celebration of these incredible women which created. Yes, who, yes, who created. yes, yes. And two of those women are here right now, Beverly yes. Fears and Jamie Oates. But if you could stand up, please, so we can acknowledge your brilliance. Yes. One of my, uh, one of the individuals I value most who ever breathed breath is mm -hmm. James Baldwin. And one of the yes. things that um, St. James Baldwin said was, go straight, to the, go straight to the heart of your fear. Mm -hmm. That is where you find the meaning and the answer. And mm -hmm. I, I, I mm -hmm. so celebrate the ways in which the, all five, mm -hmm. but the two of you, because with, with, those stories, just real rough. Um, but th thank you for, uh, for sharing them in the way that you did um, for us all. Um, we are all the better for it and all those things are true. Thanks very much for coming out again. Uh, thanks very much for our panelists. Let's give us a, one, one more time. Um, and, and the dialogue continues. The dialogue continues.